You're on. On, on live. Good morning, everyone. Good to have those of you here in the auditorium and those of you online. Uh, we, uh, Jesus' parting words, his marching orders to the church, Matthew 28, 18, and 20, is to go ye therefore and teach or make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Uh, Jesus' word, last words of the church was to go out and make disciples. Mark 16, 15 uh, says very succinctly, go ye into all, or go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And of course, it's not talking about animals, it's talking about people. So we have the good news that Jesus saves, that he came to earth to die in our place, that he rose again, he now lives in heaven, and will receive us unto himself if we will trust him. And yet, it's so hard to share. Uh, it shouldn't be, but it is hard to share. Why is that? There's a number of reasons. Number one, we are opposed by Satan. Uh, Satan hates God, and Satan hates people, and Satan opposes those that want to share the good news that Jesus saves. Satan opposes us. Uh, our sin nature opposes us. We don't like to be, most of us, uh, don't like to be confrontational. We don't like to tell people to consider their ways. We don't like to tell people that maybe they have been thinking wrong and believing wrong their entire life. We don't like to tell them that they are sinful and that there is accountability for their sin and that they will meet God someday and that they need to repent and trust Christ or they will be separated from God forever and hell. We don't like to, that, that rubs against us. We don't like to do that. So Satan opposes us, sin nature opposes us. And then third reason, and one we started to look at last week, is that I think sometimes as believers, uh, we aren't as joyful about our salvation as we should be because maybe we don't we don't understand it as well as we could we don't really grasp the significance of what we've been rescued from and so we we underappreciate it we undervalue it and we don't proclaim it because it's it's just it's it becomes commonplace to us and so we we need to last week you know we looked at John 3 I'm, I'm battling a little throat thing here, so if I'm, <clears throat> I get some allergies or something in my throat, so if I act like I'm choking, I'm only partially choking, okay? I'll be all right, don't, don't worry. Uh, but, you know, last week we looked at John 3, 16 through 18, and of course John 3, 16, very familiar verse, but we saw that our natural state, before we are born again, we are condemned already. That's what God's Word teaches, is that we are condemned already. Every one of us has sinned. All of us come short of the glory of God. The evidence is in. The guilt has been proven. The sentence has already been made, condemned. And the mystery, the unknown, is not what the outcome will be. It's when do we start serving the sentence. That is before we are born again. That is the, the state that we are in. But when we repent and we, we turn from trusting our own works in our own way, sure, sure I'll have a water, Jimmy. I, I'll distract everybody online. I'm up there sipping away, but thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Joyce. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wet my whistle a little bit here. Hopefully, not be too distracting. It's not. But uh, we we need to. Salvation comes. You know, you think of the thief on the cross. Salvation comes not even with the prayer, but it comes when we transfer our trust from us and what we do, and we turn from that. And we put our trust totally in Jesus Christ and what, what he did on the cross for us. And so we go then, when we do that, the instant we do that, we go from the state of condemned already to not condemned, never condemned. That 
is a wonderful thing. That, that news should be enough to get us to, to share that with other people. This morning, I want to look at another word picture uh, where in John, take your Bible and turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, if you're using Pew Bible, it's page 787, 787. And here's another picture that John gives us. One last week we looked at from condemned already to not condemned. And this morning we're going to look at uh, a different one from John chapter 8, beginning with verse number 41. So I'm going to read John 8, 41 through verse 44. Ye do, and Jesus is speaking, you'll notice if you have a, a red letter edition of the Bible, ye, ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We're not illegitimate children. We have one Father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Amen. This morning what we're going to look at is, and I'll, I'll tell you ahead of time, this is a part one and a part two, um, I didn't, uh, I didn't cover as much. I mean, I'm, there's a lot to cover, so I can't do it all at one time. So this morning, we're going to mainly look at big picture. The, the message is salvation is leaving the family of Satan and becoming a child of God. Uh, we're, we're just going to be looking at the family of Satan part, and then next week more of becoming a, a, a child of God. But um, before I pray, I just want to bring a couple things uh, to your uh, attention, or yeah, two. Uh, Ellen was in the hospital this week with pneumonia. She was in a couple days. I kind of got after her grandson. I'm like, you need to let me know ahead of time. Let me know earlier so we can pray. But she's home now, and she's doing better. And uh, Gary Kulon, some of you know him. He's been, uh, he is really sick. He is super sick. In fact, he said, does anybody in church have a portable oxygen machine? He, he does not want to go in. Uh, he does not want to be put on a ventilator, but he's he's having a hard time. So we need to uh, pray for him. I, I I asked him if there's anything I can do for him, and he's, he gave me a little grocery list, and he said, don't come in the house, leave it on the front step, beep the horn, and run, you know, kind of thing. So uh, not quite the run part, but anyway, um, so just pray for him. Uh, and, and I'm going to do that now as as we start. So let's pray. Father, again, we I just thank you for uh, your word. We thank you just for uh, the marvel that you want us to know these things about uh, yourself. You want us to know about ourself. You want us to know about sin. You want us to know about Satan. You want us to know about salvation. And so you have all these things uh, in your word that are truth that you want us to know and to study and to grasp and to apply and to obey. And the Lord, we thank you for this passage, uh, the teaching of Jesus. And I pray that as we look at it in depth and some other passages, that we would really uh, recognize that this is what you say. Uh, Lord, we have our preconceived notions. And we have our own sin nature that is wise in its own eyes and, and thinks that we sometimes can stand in judgment over God's word and, and pick and choose what we want to believe and what we want to obey, but Lord, I, I pray that we would see this is the words, the authoritative words of Jesus Christ, and that we would submit to what he says. Uh, we thank you that he came. We thank you that he paid the penalty. Mm -hmm. We thank you that he is the way and the truth and the life, and that uh, when he speaks, it is the truth. And he spoke that he is the only way. And so uh, I just pray that that would be firmly 
rooted in our hearts and our minds, uh, Lord, and that we would glorify you and that we would strive to please you because of what you rescued us from. Lord, we think a couple of these uh, I mentioned before. I think of Gary Kulan and, uh, at home, but very sick uh, with COVID. And uh, Lord, we, uh, we pray that you would watch over him. We pray that uh, you would allow him to get the rest that uh, he needs and that you would just protect and, and spare his life. And uh, Lord, uh, that he would just sense uh, your love and your watch care uh, even during these difficult times. And so you be with him, help his breathing. He's got phlegm in his lungs, help him get it out and, and just uh, help him with this, Lord. We pray for Ellen as well. Lord, we certainly uh, didn't know she was in the hospital, but we're glad that you knew her and that you watched over her even when we didn't know and weren't maybe praying as specifically as we could have. And so uh, we know uh, you are the great physician and you are the one that never slumbers or sleeps and that you uh, care for your children. And so we just ask that uh, you would help her now, Lord, to, to get this completely behind her. And again, Lord, we just thank you for this time that we can be in your word. Again, I don't know hearts, uh, but you do. And so I pray that you would use your word and you would apply it. And uh, Lord, if we need encouragement, bring that. If we need conviction, bring that. Uh, if we need to be shaken out of complacency, do that. And just help us to uh, love you more and serve you better because of uh, what you speak to our hearts about this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So part of me was a little bit hesitant to teach this. Uh, why? Because it's offensive? No, actually because it is so elementary. And I, I say that because back in, in Lake Mills and also in Marshfield, uh, I was a King's Kids director. And King's Kids is a Wednesday evening program. Most churches run it on Wednesday evening and it's kind of like a a uh, one night per week vacation Bible school where you have games and you have memory verses and you have a lesson time. There's not crafts, but uh, each school year, it kind of went on a school year uh, rotation. And each school year, I would start out with the children, uh, with the, the teaching and really reinforce and really make sure they got it, that although there are myriads of physical families, there are only two spiritual families. The Bible only teaches two spiritual families. And so they, I taught it enough where they got to the point where they got it. They, they, it was common knowledge to them. But it's really not common knowledge when you think of if, if you were to take a poll on the street, uh, you know, how many spiritual family after, you know, they looked at you and thought you were weird, but I mean, uh, you know, how many spiritual families are there? Many people think, well, there's God's, and then there's Satan's, and then there's the undecideds. You know, they're, they're kind of in the, well, guess what? The Bible teaches two. Two spiritual families, and one of them is not the undecideds. Okay, it is God's spiritual family, Satan's spiritual family. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. The Bible doesn't specifically say a whole lot about spiritual families. We have it here in John uh, 8, though, verse 38. You know, we, Jesus says, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which you have seen with your father. So even though spiritual fathers aren't being are mentioned here, we see that in the context that Jesus was saying, uh, there are two. You have a father, I have a father. Uh, verse 42, we see that again. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father. You know, he's saying to them, uh, God is the father of some, but he is not your father. Uh, you, and then verse 44, the verse we read earlier as well, ye are of your father, the devil. And so we're going we're gonna to come back to verse 44 in a little bit, but point number one on your outline is the, the scriptural fact that there are only two spiritual fates, not three. Now wait a minute, you might be thinking, 
we were just talking about spiritual families. Yep, but bear with me here for uh, a minute. There's only one passage, this one, that talks about spiritual fathers. Okay, there's uh, there might be some other illusions. This is uh, this is the most uh, plain though, and, and someone might think, well, how can you be dogmatic about a doctrine of only two spiritual families if there's just one passage in the Bible that talks about it? Well, here's how. Because although spiritual families aren't mentioned a lot, the fact that there are two and only two spiritual destinies, spiritual futures, spiritual fates, the fact that there are only two is a thread throughout the Bible. Uh, I have some verses there on your sheet. Daniel 12, verse number 2 says, so this is the Old Testament, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Two fates, everlasting life, everlasting contempt. Contempt. Matthew 7, I have there on your sheet, 7, 13 through 14, entry in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Two gates, two fates. Wide gate with the fate of destruction, narrow gate with the fate or the future of life. Matthew 25, 46, these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Again, two fates. We don't see three end places in the Bible. There is no, there are two. Everlasting life, everlasting destruction. Keep, uh, put a marker here or something, flip back to John chapter 3. We were there last week. Uh, page 780 in your pew Bible. I just want to look at, uh, again, kind of reinforce this, the fact that God's word is very plain. There are two end states, if I can use uh, that terminology. John 3, 15. Perish versus have eternal life. John 3, 16. Perish versus having everlasting life. John 3, 17. Talks about being condemned or being saved. Verse 18, not condemned, versus being condemned already. John 3, 36, six, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. But the verse ends, mm -hmm. he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So there's everlasting life, or the wrath of God abiding on you. John 5, 24, back to your outline, verily, verily, again, Jesus' words, very verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. 1 John 5, 12, the verse we have on our sign and on our website, website, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Revelation 20, verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Again, there are two end states, two end fates, two end futures or people. That's it. There are only two. It's impossible to miss that there are only two eternal destinies and if there are only two eternal destinies, then it stands to follow that there are only two spiritual families that we can be a member of. So number two, spiritual fate we are born into. The spiritual fate we are born into. Again, we're still in John 3. I uh, just want to review quickly some things said last week. Verse 3. John 3, verse 3. Jesus answered, said unto him, Verily, verily, for truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Pretty exclusive, isn't it? Pretty narrow-minded. Jesus Christ is the one who says, if you are not born again, you will not get into heaven. That's Jesus' words. Who does he say that to? Nicodemus, a Pharisee, 
a ruler of the Jews, what we would call a religious person, a man who loved God's word and a man who knew God's word and a man who went to church, in that case it was a synagogue, a man who prayed, a man who probably gave, all those kind of things. So we would look at him as a religious man and Jesus said to him, you, religious man, need to be born again. Why did Jesus say that? Because Nicodemus probably felt that he was pretty good. You know, if anyone felt that he could get to heaven by rule keeping, Nicodemus probably thought that. And you're like, well, how, how can you say that, Pastor? Well, it's interesting because John chapter 2 ends with, uh, talking about Jesus, verse 20, uh, verse, number, verse 24, we know it's Jesus, and then verse 25, needed not, Jesus needed not that any man should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus Christ knows what man is like. He knows what they think. He knows what they trust in. And we, if you read the Gospels at all, you'll many times come across Jesus knowing their thoughts said, boom. Jesus knew their thoughts said this. So Jesus knew what Nicodemus was counting on. And, you know, it's interesting to me, you know, it's like Nicodemus flatters him. He's like, oh, Rabbi, we know you're from heaven. We know you couldn't do these things. Jesus gets, cuts right to the chase. You need to be born again. Stop flattering me. He, he didn't say that part. But in essence, that's what he said. You need to be born again, Nicodemus. He knew what Nicodemus was like. He knew what, knew what Nicodemus was trusting in. And so Jesus said this to a religious man. Why did he say it? He probably knew what he was thinking. So what did Jesus mean by telling him he needed to be born again. What can we learn from that? First, no matter how good Nicodemus was or thought he was, he needed to do something in order to see or by implication to get into the kingdom of God. He needed to do something. If he needed to do something, he was not naturally on his way to heaven. He was not naturally going there. And if he's not naturally going to heaven, where is he going? He's going to hell, right? If he's not naturally on his way to heaven, there's only, we just spent five minutes on, there's only two destinies. There are only two destinies. Sad funeral. When a man thinks he can say some words and usher someone into heaven. Jesus Christ is the only man who can do that. There are two destinies, and Jesus said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. If you are not, you are not gonna go to heaven. He was not naturally going to heaven, so he was naturally going to hell. And then number three, uh, there was a way to get out of this state, and it's to be born again. And Jesus told him that, you need to be born again. Nicodemus didn't get it. Verse 4, how can, a, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's obviously thinking physical. Jesus says, you need to be, Jesus answered, verily I say unto you, except you be born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. I believe the water there corresponds with you. You need to be born twice. You have a natural physical birth that involves water. You need a spiritual birth. Verse 6, there is that which is born of the flesh, body, is body, flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. You need a second birth. I think it's cool we sing that song. Every time we have a birthday, it's a reminder. Oftentimes it gets talked about in there. We talked about it this morning in Sunday school. Uh, you are born twice, you die once. You are born once, you die twice. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in this message. But there are, here's to kind of recap what we've looked at so far. Jesus teaches there are two eternal destinies, not three. In our natural state, we are hellbound. We need to be born again to get into heaven. And by implication, if there are only two eternal destinies, 
then there are only two spiritual families, God's and Satan's. If our natural fate is that we're hellbound, then our natural state is that we naturally, we are born into Satan's spiritual family. You're like, wow. Think about that. Every person you know, there is no undecided camp. Every person you know, every person I know, including you yourself, are in God's spiritual family or Satan's spiritual family. I'm not a mind reader. But I can't help but think someone by this is like, wait a minute, Pastor. You mean to tell me if I am not born again, if I'm in limbo, that I'm a child of the devil? That's what God says. And then the follow-on thought probably is, but Pastor, I don't like the devil. I hate the devil. I don't worship him, and I don't follow him, and I don't imitate him. How can you say he is my spiritual father? Think about it this way. Might think, think about your possible relationship with your biological father. I last saw my biological father 35 years ago. Haven't seen him since. He's still alive. I don't know him. I don't love him. I don't hate him. I don't imitate him. I don't call him for wisdom or guidance. I don't consult him. I don't bounce things off. I don't, I, I don't know. He's a stranger to me. That was a, a choice that he made. But just because I haven't learned things from him does not mean that there's not some resemblance there. Uh, there are some things I, that I didn't learn from him that I have from him because he's my biological father. That is how it works. And so the same is true in the spiritual realm. If you are not born again, you, you have a resemblance to Satan. Of course, not in looks, but in attitudes and actions in, and desires. And so what is the devil like? How does he operate? What are the characteristics? Uh, Jesus answered some of those questions back in, in John chapter 8. So let's uh, flip back there. John chapter 8, again, 787, if you're using a pew Bible. Point number three on your outline. The spiritual father of the spiritual family we are born into. So in the time we have left, we're going to look at some of the characteristics of Satan that Jesus teaches here. Uh, next week, we're going to look at how the unsaved have some of the same characteristics as Satan. And then we're going to look at, uh, in part two, praise the Lord, what we leave behind and what God, our Father, is like when we trust Christ. So right, right now, even though the, the title of the message was leaving the family of Satan, getting into the family of God, um, we're, we're still, we're, I'm going to leave you a whole week stuck in the family of the devil. Well, no, not, but <laughs> I mean, you, you know what I mean. So here we go. Characteristics of Satan. Letter A, characteristics of Satan. Please note, I am not trying to give you everything the Bible says about Satan. We're going to look at just this one passage, John chapter 8. And it's the things that make Satan Satan. And of course, uh, we're not concerned with what Satan looks like. Uh, we're concerned with his nature. So again, back to John chapter 8. He was a murderer. Some point number 1, verse 44. He was a murderer from the beginning. Does Satan walk around and physically murder people? No, but 
In a sense, you could say yes. Uh, 1 John 3.12, first part of that verse on your outline, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. Cain was of the wicked one. Cain was of Satan, and slew his brother. We'd certainly agree that abortion is not of God. The murder of helpless babies is of the devil, and it is certainly physical in nature. But when Jesus says he was a murderer from the beginning, he's talking about more than that, not just the physical aspect, but he's talking about the spiritual realm. How do we know that? Think back, and here's where uh, the, the young people got a, a sneak preview Think back to, to Genesis 2.17, have it there on your outline. Uh, Genesis 2.17, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Adam and Eve, you know, you know the account, right? Adam and Eve were deceived and they disobeyed and they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and they immediately plopped over dead. No, they didn't. I asked the kids, so how long was it? Um, one answer was, seven days. Seven days? Where did that come from? I said, remember, they had children after this. They did not drop over dead. And so we have this, ooh, did God lie? Was God mistaken? Was God giving an empty threat, like so many of us parents do? You do this, you're going to ground you for life. Yeah, right. They know better, and you know better, and so they do it. Uh, God was not doing any of that. God said, the day that you eat thereof, you will die. So they did die. Not physically, they died in the spiritual realm. Think about this. They went from a state, in fact, one of the kids asked this question, I thought that, I thought that was good. So I, I said, they were innocent, they had not sinned. And they said, did that mean they were perfect, like God? It means, the theologians will refer to it as uh, innocence in an unconfirmed state. They had not been tested yet. And when they were, to, they were innocent. They were sin-free. They did not have a sin nature within them. Okay? They made a choice. We're going to talk about that. But they were deceived. But think about it. They went, the only people in human history that went from a state of not condemned, naturally, to condemned. And so they went from a state of innocence state of no condemnation hanging over their head to when they sinned, they were now condemned. So they were spiritually sentenced, just like all of us are. We're born with it. They, they, it happened to them after they made that choice. So they went from a state of not condemned to now condemned. They spiritually were separated from God. Uh, we'll also see, and we're not going to turn there, but if we looked at uh, Genesis, we would see, we are going to go there, but we're not going to look at the verse. They were also driven out of the garden. They were no longer uh, able to reach out and take from the tree of life. So they went from a fate of being with God forever, eternal life, to one of being separated from God, spiritually uh, in hell, eternal death, unless God intervened. And of course he did. So point number two, Satan was not just a murderer that plunged mankind into sin. He was also the father of lies. Before we get to that at the end of the verse, it's interesting uh, how much in this one verse Jesus places, uh, how much emphasis he places on the untruthfulness of Satan. Abode not in the truth. 
Verse 44 in the middle. Abode not in the truth. There was no truth in him. Speaketh a lie. Speaketh of his own. Father of lies. There is an emphasis on the, on the lyingness, the untruthfulness of Satan. And then it says, for he is a liar and the father of it. It refers to falsehood and lying. Satan is the father. He's the originator of falsehood. Barnes writes, from him, falsehood first proceeded and all liars possess his spirit and are under his influence. Uh, I like what Bruce says, the devil utters falsehood as naturally and spontaneously as God utters truth. Satan utters falsehood, falsehood as naturally and spontaneously as God utters truth. And I think it's interesting uh, take your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 3. I want to I wanna look at this. It's easy to find in the front of your Bible. Page 3 if you're using a pew Bible. Maybe page 4 in your Bible. You'll find it. But it's interesting how in the verse we just looked at, Jesus ties in a murderer with a liar. The un, the, his untruthfulness with being a murderer from the beginning. Verse 4, the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. Satan is casting doubt on God's word. Casting doubt on God's word, but if you think about it, in essence, Satan is saying, God is lying to you, Eve. Whew. That's what he's saying, isn't it? Yea, hath God said, ye shall not surely die. God is lying to you. Verse number five, he, he adds to his persuasion. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Here, instead of doubting, casting doubt on the Word of God, he casts doubt on the character of God, casts doubt on God's wisdom and God's goodness. God is keeping stuff from you. He knows you're going to get better if you eat. He wants to keep you from that. God doesn't love you. That's why he's doing that. But underneath that is this. You will be better off disobeying God than obeying him. Wow. Isn't that what it is? That's what he's saying. You will be better off if you disobey God. Think about that. The liar calls God a liar, and she believes him. And the liar says, you will be better off not listening to God, and she believes that too. Who in their right mind would do that? Logically, that doesn't make any sense, does it? And yet, millions of I'm not exaggerating to say millions throughout human history have chosen to believe the father of lies over the truth of God's word. Ye shall not surely die is dressed up a little bit. There is no such place as hell, is how some say it. Or once we die, we die. There is no more. Us. There is no life after death. Or, probably one of the more held on to ones, God is too loving to send people to hell. They all say the same thing. Ye shall not surely die. And underneath it is God is a liar. He is not telling you the truth. Satan is a murderer from the beginning. 
His greatest joy, and I put that in quotes, I believe, is to drag people to hell with him. His fondest words, think about this. His fondest words are to hear Jesus say, Depart from me, you cursed, in the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And his greatest tool to accomplish that is to suggest to you and to suggest to me that God does not tell the truth mm -hmm. and that life is better if we disobey his word. What about you? What about me? Is it possible that we, that you have been deceived by Satan? You know, I, I was at that, that funeral and it was like, Wow, here's a huge group of people that they honestly were thinking that this man could put my mom into heaven or that she suffered so much and that was going to do it or she lived such a good life and that was going to do it. And all those things, I'm not trying to be cold and cow, all those things are lies from Satan. They're lies from Satan. And... He has gotten really good at it. And so what about us? You know, what, how do we look at this book? Let's pray. Father, again, we, we are so thankful that you give us the Bible. We're, we're so thankful that we have the objective truth of God that we can read for ourselves. And Lord, we know that there's extremes. Uh, people think Satan is make-believe and a red dude with horns and a pointy tail and a spear in his hand. And yet your word tells us he's a roaring lion and he is a murderer from the beginning. And he's the father of lies and that he hates you and he hates people. And he wants to drag people to hell with him. And Lord, I, I pray that we would recognize that we can be deceived. Uh, we can, that we would recognize that, that we can depend on our own wisdom instead of the wisdom of your word. And so I just pray that we would be honest and humble about what you say, that we would believe what you say, even if it contradicts what we have been taught in the past, and that, Lord, we would just embrace the truth that Jesus gave, that we need to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Again, we just uh, thank you that you know hearts, work in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> so what would God have us do? First and foremost, Answer in your heart and your mind, have I been born again? That's what Jesus said we need to do to escape hell. Have I been born again? It is what we need to do to get out of Satan's spiritual family into God's family. Satan is good at deceiving. And there are many that are deceived. Don't be one of them. What about us as believers? Do we sometimes doubt God's word? Do we sometimes, if I obey that, <clears throat> ah, no, it will not, that will not be best for me to obey. We're doing the same thing. We're saying it will, it will be bad. Things will be worse for us if we obey God. That is not true. And so, uh, we're going to stand 570, blessed be the tie that binds, kind of a weird uh, invitation hymn. Sometimes I pick the, the hymns early in the week and the message changes as the week goes on. But 570, Arts and Don are going to come.